appreciate you, Brother Keith. I, I'm in Carico, as been said, and um, it's a joy to be here this morning uh, to worship with you all. And I just want to say right off the bat, I'm a step down from what you have on an ongoing basis, Brother Keith. Amen. This is the bottom of the barrel right here. But uh, you just need to know that you've got one of the absolute best pastors in all the world, Brother Keith. Amen. Somebody say amen. That's right. And uh, I'll, I'll take a step further down the road and say you've got one of the best staff in all the world right here. Amen. What about this worship team and youth children's ministry? That's good. It's good stuff. And uh, I praise the Lord that his hand is on you in this place. God has blessed you all. And when I just look around at this building, it tells a story. It tells a story of God's grace and his goodness to you all. And the truth of the matter is, this is a building, but uh, I'm looking at you. You're the church. This is a people of God, and God has assembled you here for such a time as this. And uh, it's a joy just to be a, a small glimpse of it, standing here this morning. Again, really the bottom of the barrel is what you're going to get. But uh, I praise the Lord for His good grace and the opportunity to worship with you. It is good to have my family here. When you was introducing all of them, I thought, well, this is probably a good place to say the in-laws and the outlaws and everybody in between is here. Amen? And uh, I, I just uh, am thankful for my family. Couldn't do it without them and their support. Uh, it was a joy to serve 10 years at Beulah Baptist Church. And I know you all probably have heard of Beulah Baptist Church and and uh, it's good to just connect with, reconnect with a lot of you in here. I was just thinking again the front row of all the many ways that God has connected me with several of you all in here throughout the years. Um, and just how God assembled that and to reconnect with you all. And then, of course, to, to look at your face and see how God continues to work in your life and see how we're this much further down the road. Uh, but also to, to make new friends with so many of you all, and uh, that's, that's good as well. So, uh, man, I, if I didn't talk to you beforehand, maybe we can connect afterward. Uh, I, got to, I think I got the spiritual gift of just hanging out, and so um, if we can do that, uh, I'd be, be, be honored to do that as well. This morning, if you got your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4, and if you'll make your way down to verse 34, that's where I'm going to begin. John 4, verse 34, I'm going to read down to verse number 38. John 4. 34, verse number 38 is where I will read down to this morning. As you open your copy of God's Word, I, I want to just let you know that we're going to preach and study and think about and I trust be encouraged in the Lord around the title and subject, The Urgency of the Gospel. The Urgency of the Gospel. John 4, 34. I love to hear the pages of God's Word turning, Brother Keith. That's a beautiful sound. And if you don't have that, one preacher said, if you don't hear the turning of the pages in the Bible, he loves to see the glow on your face. And uh, that's the tablets and the phones we have these days, I guess. But any way you can get there, get there. That's the most important thing. It's not what Ian has to say. It's what God has to say through His Word. And that's where we want to anchor our time this morning, and that's where my prayer will be, that God will speak to us through His Word. His Word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And this is a good Word. It's a Word that we all need this morning. And so this is what the Holy Spirit says, John 4, 34. I'll again read down to verse number 38. The Bible says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for the harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored, others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Let's pray this morning and then we'll dive in. Father God, thank you for this great church. Thank you for the great pastor and staff you've assembled at this church. Lord, this is evidence of your grace your mercy, your providence, your sovereignty. And Father, we rejoice this morning, right now in this moment, of all that you have done. 
But Lord, we also anticipate what you're going to do today and the days to come. And so dear Lord, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, you would work in a powerful way, that you would do exceedingly abundantly above anything that I could ask or think, that any of us collectively could ask or think. And dear Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would search every row, every heart. And dear God, the ultimate reality in my prayer is that we would be one step closer to you when we leave this place. God, that nobody that entered would leave the same. But Lord, we would be different because we've had an, an encounter with you. Lord, I do pray, as has already been prayed, that if there's somebody here this morning or maybe watching online now or later, dear Lord, if they're lost, they don't have a relationship with you, Father, I pray today would be the day of repentance and faith in you. Today would be the day of salvation. Lord, I pray for the saved, dear God, that they might be edified. Lord, that we may get a glimpse of the urgency that's before us in the gospel. And God, that we would not just hear the alarms going off, we would not just feel the, the bump of the heart in our chest, but dear Lord, we would respond by the urgency before us. God, that we might be on the edge of our seats every single day of our lives. Be willing to be faithful to the task before us. Live with lifted eyes looking on the fields. God, looking at the people before us, around us. Lord, I pray that maybe if there's somebody that's just been content this morning with the way things are, God, you might shake them out of that place. And God, I pray that that burden would be, would be envisioned again. And God, that that burden might be found on an altar where they're sitting or on the front of this platform. And dear God, that ultimately you'd break our hearts over the lostness all around us. So Lord, help us this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen. Before we dive in, I just want to kind of give a glimpse of where we're going this morning. Of course, we've read the text, we've prayed and I'm going to be giving a message, you're going to have three points to it, and they'll be broken up probably very preacher-like, like you may typically hear, or sometimes we anticipate to hear. At the end of the message, I'll have a time of prayer. That time of prayer will be entering into what most all of us understand is a time of response, it's a time of invitation. Maybe you're visiting for the first time in a long time, or maybe this is the first time you've been in church, and you just you're kind of like, feel like an alien in outer space, right? You're trying to figure out what's going on. The time of invitation is one of the most important times in the church because that's going to be the time for you to respond. If you're lost without Jesus this morning, that time of invitation is going to be a time where everybody's going to be standing together. Brother Bobby and probably some of the other teams are going to be leading in worship. Brother Keith will be standing up front here. and It's going to be a time for you to step forward. That's a time for you to get saved. You're lost without Jesus. Maybe you've wondered for some time, what do I do? How do I respond? That's a time for you to respond. Very simple, you'll ask somebody to get out of your way. I'd even encourage you to bring somebody along with you. But you're going to come. Maybe you've got some questions. I've been there and done that before. I had a lot, of, I had a lot more questions than I had answers about what it means to be a Christian. And I had many people around me in my life, my family included, that helped me understand those questions. If you've got questions this morning, this is a place to find answers. You come down front here and you find answers to any question that you have. That invitation time is going to be a time for Christians to come and you're going to lay your burden down on the altar. Lord God's going to lay somebody on your heart for you to pray for its loss without Jesus. Don't dismiss that. Relish that opportunity. Lift that person up before the Lord. The Holy Spirit's going to encourage some of you this morning that you need to witness to somebody. You've got a neighbor, you've got a friend, you've got a family member. You've just been a little reluctant. You've made all kinds of excuses. I don't know what to say. I haven't been to church enough. I haven't been in Sunday school enough. And this morning, God, the Holy Spirit's going to release you. You need to share the gospel with that person the best you know how. It's been said, if you know enough of the gospel to be saved, you know enough of the gospel to share with somebody else how they can be saved. And I thought that was a pretty good word when I heard a preacher say that. This morning's going to be the time the Holy Spirit's going to release you, and you're going to go, and you're going to witness to somebody. You're going to come up front, and you're going to pray. That invitation time's going to be a time for you to respond. It's a beautiful time in the church. The reason I say that is because I just don't want there to be any tricks or some of you have been, you know, pondering and wondering what it's like to, uh, to respond. That's your time to respond. Amen. Brother Keith's preached his heart out for weeks and other preachers have preached and you've been reluctant to respond. And I just felt led the Lord to just encourage you Amen. to respond. Maybe it's the first time in a long time. Maybe it'll be the first time ever. 
But I tell you what, there's no better feeling than responding to what the Holy Spirit has to say in your heart. I'd go a step further. During the preaching, if you feel the Holy Spirit is convicting you to be saved, don't wait. Get saved. Respond to the Holy Spirit's call on your life. If you've got to get up, you're not going to interrupt me. I'm going to preach regardless. i got four boys. You're not going to bother me a bit. I'm just going to keep preaching until I'm done, right? Or until Brother Keith says that's enough and you've got to get off. But I'm going to keep preaching. You just come and you deal with whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in your heart. Maybe you need to come during the sermon and pray at the altar. You come and pray. Let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. I just say all that to encourage you in the Lord this morning in regard to being sensitive to the Holy Spirit as He speaks to you. Because that's a holy moment. That's a holy place to be. And don't quench the Holy Spirit of God when he speaks to your heart. You know, when I think about the Holy Spirit speaking, I think about the urgency. And I think about all the many things in our life that prompts us to urgency. Well, I think about emails. Some of us deal with emails. Some of us don't read the emails like we ought to. And some of us probably don't respond to emails like we ought to. But occasionally I'll receive an email in my inbox and then it'll have a red exclamation point by it. What that indicates is this is urgent, meaning you need to respond to this email. There's urgent information in the email, and this requires you to take action as soon as you possibly can. That's urgent. This morning, I would dare say, I'm not a medical doctor, but if you're having chest pains, and those chest pains are finding their way down your left arm, I've heard before, you need to take action. You need to respond. I don't think Brother Keith's going to be offended this morning. If you've got some chest pains and that pain's going down your left arm, you probably need to call 911 or find somebody in this place that is a medical professional so they can treat you. That's an urgent situation. And some of you say amen to that because you've been there and done that before. You've been in the ER because you have felt the urgency come upon you. Well, I think about things like coffee. Somebody say Amen. When you're out of coffee in the morning, that's urgent. I mean, you'll go to Walmart in your pajamas to get some coffee. You know what I mean? I mean, my day runs on coffee. And so if I'm out of coffee, I'm going to go to the Dollar General because there's one every two miles down the road. I'm going to get me some coffee. You know what I mean? And it don't matter what I look like. I'm going to go. That's urgent. You've got your urgent things in your life that you respond to. Brother Keith mentioned my mother-in-law here is here today, Miss Joy, and uh, tax taxes. Now, I don't want to go there. I know she doesn't want to go there this morning, but there is a date on the calendar. Is it April 15th? That's an urgent date. You've got to respond one way or the other. And I don't know anything about taxes. To be honest, I've tried to stay out of it as long as I possibly could. And I, but I've under, I understand enough about it that that date on the calendar prompts you to urgency. Some of you love that date because you get some cash in the pocket. You know what I mean? Kind of like Brother Clint this morning. Uh, that money he got, uh, his wife got in the purse, you know. Uh, you like that day. Others of you dread that day. And you drag your feet way too long. That's urgent. I say all of these things to ultimately get to this. The most urgent truth that you and I, sitting in this sanctuary right now, have before us is eternal life it is heaven and hell it is the truth of God's word before humanity this morning you are in one of two places yourself you're lost or you're saved those that you know around you are in one of two places they are lost or they are saved the gospel the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ prompts us to be urgent people. To respond with urgency. Every single second that ticks on our watches and on our clocks is one less second that we have on this planet and it's one more second that we're closer to eternal life. That is the eternal destiny that people will face, heaven or hell. The Lord Jesus Christ came to die for the sins of the world. He died on an old rugged cross, shedding his blood on that cross. Jesus Christ went to a borrowed tomb. It was borrowed because he was only going to be there three days. 
He resurrected from the dead. The Bible tells us that he showed himself to many witnesses for 40 days and 40 nights. It wasn't a phantom. It wasn't a ghost. People saw him. They saw the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. After 40 days and 40 nights, we understand that he ascended back up into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Could return at any moment's time. The Lord Jesus Christ did that for you and for me so that we may know God the Father, so that Jesus would save us, so that Jesus would redeem us. And here's the truth that you and I now have as believers, if you're a believer this morning, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been given a commission. It's called the Great Commission. That is for you and I to go into all the world and share this wonderful message that lost people, people that are hopeless, people that are broken, no matter where you're from, no matter what you've done, no matter how far off you've been, no matter how many excuses you've made, no matter where you are right at this moment, lost people can have a relationship with Creator God through Jesus Christ Himself, through faith in Jesus Christ. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. I'm telling you what, it's a free gift from Almighty God. That's how much He loves you and me and how much He loves the world. And He has given you and I the wonderful privilege to share this glorious gospel. We understand we share this gospel because lost people are really lost. Lost people are really lost. Listen, here's the truth. You, many of you know this. Maybe we just need to be reminded of this this morning. That when a lost person dies without Jesus Christ, when they die without a relationship with Jesus Christ, they go to hell. There's no second chances. There's no second good wishes. That is it. That is done. And here's the truth. Many of you and I, myself, we know people all around us that are lost. Lost people are really lost. And if you and I, as good Baptists, amen, as good Bible-believing Christians, if you and I would reflect and meditate and let our minds and our hearts marinate in the truth that lost people are really lost and that lost people without Jesus Christ are going to die and go to hell forever without Him. If we understand that and we embrace that, that should cause us to be urgent people. Because there's nothing more horrific this morning than to know somebody would die and go to hell where the fire's never put out, where the worm never dies, where there's no escape. This morning, if you're lost, the good news is you can be saved. And here's what I'd tell you right now. I wouldn't wait to be saved. I'd be saved right where you're sitting. You say, how'd I get saved? Repent of your sins and believe on Jesus Christ. Believe in what he done for you. It's a free gift of God. Embrace it. Pull it close. Get saved. The response time here in just a moment is going to be a time for you to rejoice. You're going to come forward and you're going to say, I just gave my heart to Jesus. I'm not going to play with eternity like that. And I got saved. For many others in this room, this sanctuary this morning, this truth, as we reflect on Scripture, is a truth that should call us to action. Because it's an urgent truth. This morning, we're going to learn from the Master and how we can be urgent in the Gospel. As we reflect in John chapter 4, I read verses 34 through 38. Obviously, it's a part of a bigger context of Scripture. It prompts us really, I think, with this big overarching question. Does what we believe about evangelism, or that is to say, us sharing the good news of how somebody can be saved, do what we believe about evangelism and what we practice in evangelism really match up? Because if what we believe and what we practice does not match up, then you and I have got to take action. It's not enough for you and I to sit in these seats and just be comfortable in this sanctuary with the truth that we hear. 
You and I, on a day-to-day basis, and especially in this moment, are called to action. Does what I believe about everything I just said, and we do, amen, because we believe the Bible, that lost people are really lost, that there's a heaven and there's a hell, and that God sent His Son Jesus to rescue the perishing through faith in Him, if what we believe about that is not giving us not only marching orders, but action in those orders to be about the Father's business, the big question this morning is why? What? And then how can I respond? And the reason I love this passage of Scripture is because I believe the Lord Jesus Christ gives us kind of this perfect ingredient. I would call it three reasons that you and I should be urgent in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's three ingredients to a heart that is prompted and encouraged to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You already dive in this morning? Wake up your sleepy neighbor if they're asleep this morning because now it's time to get into the Word. Amen? That was all introduction. And some of you think, Lord God, I hope Brother Keith never gets in back. And I tell a lot of churches I go into, I'm kind of like the one-hit wonder. You know, Brother Bobby? Uh, I'm in a lot of churches one time, and they will never see me again. And I picked up on the reason why. I preach too long, I preach too hard, or something else. I spit on somebody, I don't know, but they don't get me back. Uh, this might be the case here this morning, I don't know. But uh, I've just had to kind of develop some thick skin and just deal with it, amen? But three ingredients, three reasons why you and I should be urgent in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number one, because of the priority of the harvest. Because of the priority of the harvest. You and I should be urgent in sharing the gospel because of the priority of the harvest. Look at verse 34 of John chapter 4. Notice this is, if you've got a red letter edition Bible, this is going to be red letters right here. Jesus Christ is speaking. Notice what he says here. And I'm going to give some context because we've got to understand this context to really, I think, grasp these verses. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, if you're, if you like, you know, if you're in a good place to talk back, this would be a good place to say, wow. I mean, here's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's obviously having a conversation. This conversation in this moment, in this context, is with the disciples. He is really, um, at, you know, like Jesus does, he's answering a question, but he's also asking questions, you know? And in this moment of dialogue and really confusion with the disciples, he outlines his journey to Jerusalem because he tells them that he has a task before him. And this task before him is to finish the work. Now, when you and I step back, and the reason we say wow is because the reality of Jesus' finished work means this. The Son of God was going to have to be crucified on the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ, like a flint set before him, had his face toward the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ was born to die. He was born to die because of sinful humanity. He had one task before him. The task before him was to please his Father, Father God. And to please his Father meant that he had to walk in complete obedience. The complete obedience set before him in this moment was to have a conversation with a Samaritan woman. This is where it all just kind of gets real. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ. He had a goal in mind like you and I when we get up on Monday morning or Sunday morning or Wednesday morning. The Lord Jesus Christ was going to go to Galilee. Verse number 4 of John 4 tells us that he had to go through Samaria. King James Version, I love it. I must needs go through Samaria. I mean, it's like the Lord Jesus Christ. He could have took another route, but Jesus said, I've got to go through Samaria. And so here he goes. He's on his way to Samaria. On his way to Samaria, there's a well. At the well, he has an encounter with a Samaritan woman. There's a lot of reasons culturally and, of course, contextually in the Bible that the Lord Jesus Christ in this moment Uh, you know, probably wouldn't be having a conversation with a Samaritan and then a woman. I mean, this is a combination for his disciples to ask him lots of questions. Like, culturally, Jesus, this just doesn't make sense. Like, what in the world are you doing? But here's what's interesting. While Jesus is on his way to Samaria, if you look at verse number 8, 
the disciples, they had to go buy some food. They're like you and me. Those grocery bills, I don't know if they were high then. But um, they had to go buy some food. Now we got to put a time out on that to ultimately get to where we are in verse 34. Because in between the disciples exiting to go to the Dollar General to stock up on some groceries, amen, Walmart or wherever, in between that and them coming back, Jesus has this conversation with the Samaritan woman. Here's what we got to love about that conversation. Jesus was having the conversation, amen. He was revealing to her eternal life. In that moment, her eyes were opened up to the reality of her sinfulness. She, in that moment, went back to her town to tell all of her friends and buddies, I think I've met the Messiah. I've met this man that knows all about me. There's something different about him. I mean, this is an amazing... i got to summarize it because time won't allow me. Y'all are getting hungry right now. Amen? Somebody say amen. Y'all are getting hungry. Don't, I mean, don't look at me funny. I know I'm probably like an alien up here, but don't. You're getting hungry, and I only got a limited amount of time. But here in this moment, in this conversation with a Samaritan woman, oh, wait, here comes the disciples, and they've got food. And we pick up before verse 34. If we kind of, uh, let's just nudge up a little bit. Um, let's, go, let's go to verse 28. Okay, can we go to verse 28? Let's go to verse 28. Here's what the Bible says. The woman then left her water pot. She went her way into the city and she said to the men, Come see a man who told all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and they came to him. Oh, here's where it gets good. Here's verse number 31. I love the Bible, don't you? In the meantime. <laughs> in the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. Oh yeah, they went and they found the food. They brought the food back. Physical food. I mean, you know, we was talking in the foyer out there. Amen, brother? We was talking in the foyer about Texas Roadhouse Rose. They're going to be at the marriage supper of the cross. Amen? I just I know that in eternity. You put down some rose in front of me, I'm going to have a really hard time talking about anything. Amen? Here's food that the disciples have brought back. Jesus is hanging out. Jesus obviously has his priorities, obviously, amen, he's the son of God, perfect son of God, sinless son of God, has his priorities in line. In this moment, Jesus pulls the disciples in and he teaches them a lesson about what is most important. Chief Cornerstone, this is a moment for you to lean in. To get on the edge of your seat. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is just about to give a lesson on how to live urgent in the gospel. The disciples take the food, they bring it to Jesus, they say, Rabbi, eat. Verse 32, this is what he says, don't you love it? He says, I have food to eat of that which you do not know. Don't you love that response? Well, that'll bless you, won't it? The disciples are sitting here. They begin to scratch their head. Verse 31 says, <laughs> I love this. Don't you love to be a fly on the wall or a tree or a plant or wherever? Here's what the disciples said to one another. Has anyone brought him anything to eat? I mean, here's your Baptist business meeting right here. They come over here to the side and they start saying, boys, who brought him something to eat? Did somebody thwart our plan? Did somebody rob us of the blessing? Where did Jesus find food? It just makes sense that he ought to be eating. And here's what Jesus does. Jesus takes that food and he begins to answer them in verse 34. In verse 34, we see a lesson on priority. It's a lesson on the priorities of the Christian life. It's a lesson on the priority of what is set before us. It is, listen to me, church, it is getting the main thing right. right it is having appropriate focus. It is getting our heart affection in the right place. It is us not focusing on all the things of this world, but focusing on one. That is God the Father. Jesus, in this moment, in verse 34, he said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. 
What we see in this passage of Scripture, that while the disciples and the Lord Jesus Christ himself probably could have very easily taken this food, we don't know what kind of food, but they could have taken the, he could have taken this food, and while he could have eaten this food, in this moment, he steps aside and begins to teach them a lesson. It's a lesson on doing the Father's will. What is the Father's will for the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus reveals it. He says, my food, that is to say, just like those texts, Texas Roadhouse Rose. Somebody say amen. We say they hit the spot. They hit the spot so much we go back for seconds and thirds way beyond what anybody should probably do. We go back because that food hits the spot. Jesus says, you know what hits the spot? What hits the spot for the Christian person is whenever you're in the will of God and when you're walking with God, when your heart is on fire for God, when your heart loves what God loves, when you're focused on what God is focused on, when you're focused on His Word, when you're living in prayer, when you're walking day by day, by day beside what God wants, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus teaches us a lesson on the priority of our life. Our priority ought to be on doing the Father's will in our life. What is the, what is the Father's will in this context, in this moment? We see it all throughout the Bible, especially the Gospels. The priority of the Father is to send his son Jesus Christ from heaven to earth to die on an old rugged cross to be hung on that cross naked between heaven and hell between the, between earth itself hung suspended dying on a cross going to a tomb raising back from the dead showing himself to many witnesses victorious over death hell and the grave that was the father's will and Jesus Christ before he ascended back up in heaven says disciples I'm giving you a task I want you to go I want you to go into all the world and I want you to tell the world about what I have done for them and I will save them here's what we understand sanctification that is to say, day by day walking with God. Day by day focusing on what God wants for our life. Sanctification always undergirds evangelization. I'm going to say that again. Sanctification will always undergird evangelization. Let me break it down a little bit lower because as I was saying out front, I like to put things on the bottom shelf where we can just kind of reach up there and get them. Amen? The closer you are to God the more likely you are to tell other people about God. That's right, amen. That's it. That's it. Here it is. The closer you get to the fire, the more you're going to feel its warmth. Right. But you start neglecting prayer. Hey, church, some of you are here right now. We've all been there and done that. You start neglecting prayer. You stop reading your Bible. Right. You turn away that prayer list for lostness. You start becoming lukewarm and half-hearted in your church uh, uh, fellowship. When you start skipping Sunday school, when you stop participating, on, the further you get away, the less likely you're going to be to tell somebody about Jesus. You can mark it down every time. Yeah, right. But here's the opposite, because I want to be, you know, optimistic. I have a hard time. Sometimes I'm a little bit too pessimistic, I think, you know. But I want to be optimistic this morning. The closer you get to the fire, the more you live on the altar. Yeah, that's right. The more you're in the Word, and the Word gets in you. <laughs> The more you pray, the more you focus on God, the more you die to yourself. Hey, listen, the more you, listen, the less you worry about what other people think about you, the more likely you are to tell other people about Jesus because it'll come out of you. God gives you a Holy Ghost boldness the closer you get to Him. Here's what Jesus said. My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish his work. <laughs> Listen, we can learn something from Jesus. We always learn something from Jesus. Amen? Amen. This morning particularly, we can learn something from Jesus right here. You know what we need to learn? We need to get as close to God as we possibly can on this side of eternity. Listen, you're going to have to fight for it. I mean, you're going to have to surrender yourself for it. This morning, some of you are going to have to repent of some things. There's some sin in your life that has shut your mouth. Satan has shut your mouth because there's some sin in your life that is hindering you from telling other people, lost people, that are going to die and go to hell. They're lost. They're really lost. And who's going to tell them if you and I don't? Who's going to tell them if we don't? 
There's some sin in your life this morning that you're going to crucify. It's all about living with the right priorities. It's about focusing on God. It's about doing His work. Listen, just like food satisfies our physical body, so does doing the will of God satisfy our soul. There's nothing like it in all the world. Years ago when I was at uh, Beulah and Joy went over once with us, we took, or I, I guess I took three trips to West Africa in Ghana. Long story short, John Moody, he was a former International Mission Board missionary. I met John Moody when I went to seminary in Kansas City. And John Moody lived several years over there as an IMB missionary, wound up moving back to the States. And John Moody was, he, uh, I guess, formed his own ministry, mission ministry, where he would lead teams over to Ghana. And one of those trips, I just felt led of the Lord. I can't explain it, but I just felt led to just go on this mission trip to Africa. I'd never been hardly anywhere, really hardly anywhere before my life. I was born and raised in Carlisle County. We didn't even go very far from there, amen. And so I'd never even traveled much. Still don't, I don't guess travel much except, say, to Kentucky in this role that I'm in now. But uh, didn't travel very far, but went to West Africa. And I remember sitting in a, uh, a taxi cab in, in Ghana. Oh, well, you talk about an experience. And you, some of y'all been on mission trips before. It's wild, ain't it? I mean, it, boy, it's just, it's just plum wild, especially for a country boy that just doesn't know how to, how to do anything. And uh, you're sitting there, and I thought, I look over at John, and I said, John, I said, I love this. I said, I love it. And listen, from a human standpoint, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's nothing that I should really probably be loving about this. I'm riding with a stranger that I don't even know. I don't think he spoke English. <laughs> it was hot. I probably had B.O., you know. Didn't hardly, couldn't hardly brush your teeth, you know. Probably had bad breath. Probably stunk. Uh, didn't have any idea what I was doing. I mean, somebody could have captured me, and I wouldn't know whether they was being nice to me or really mean to me, you know. I didn't have any idea what was going on. I looked over at John. I said, John, man, I love this. And John Moody in that moment brought up this text. I don't guess I'll ever forget it as long as I'm in my right mind. He said, Ian, that's what, doing, that's what doing God's will does for you. It brings a deep satisfaction to your soul. And there's just something about being in the will of God. Sometimes you and I have those questions, what is the will of God? And I, listen, we deal with all those big questions. I don't have an easy answer for it. But there's just something about being surrendered on the altar. The altar of our heart. It's just something about pursuing God with all of your heart, making the best next decision that you can in holiness. There's something about living with a priority and doing what God wants for your life. And when you're doing that, no matter who you're talking to, it may be your worst enemy, God may lead you on the worst case scenario mission trip. God may be compelling some of you to walk across the street and share the gospel with your neighbor and you never thought you'd do it. Listen, don't get the cart before the horse. You know what I'm saying? Don't get the cart before the horse. Here's your first step. Don't be thinking about all the results. Just surrender to God. You think, well, it just seems too easy. That's your problem. And listen, I, I'll just, let me just relinquish you. That's my problem. My biggest problem is in. Because I, th I overthink it. I overstretch it. I overlook it. I, try, I make things bigger than they really are. I'll get down on myself. I'll get down on others. Man, I'll get down on everybody. And what I've got to remember is God ain't hiding. God ain't hiding His will from you. God's not like a magician, amen? God is God. He is holy. God has given us His Word, the inspired, inerrant, infallible, powerful Word of God. You and I have everything we need to accomplish His will for our life. His will is not a mystery. His will is before us. His will is complete surrender to Himself. And when you surrender yourself to God, I, listen, you need to take that as a good word this morning. You surrender yourself to God, God will lead you in His good, perfect will. And as God leads you, He'll lead you through the valley, on the mountaintop, through trials and tribulations. But God is with you and God will help you. God will strengthen you with His righteous right hand. 
person. God will help you to share the good news of the gospel with that person that you are trembling before because God is God and God is not hiding. God desires to help his people to be with his people. He loves us, church, and he wants to help us. You and I have got to surrender to God. You and I have got to make our food his will. You and I have got to find satisfaction in just sitting before him, saying, yes, Lord, whatever you want me to do, speak to me, Lord. God, make the confusing clear. God, just bring anything you can to God. You're not going to disrupt God. God can handle anything you bring to him. So I'm making him a, pri making him a priority. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now I better move on or lest y'all kick me out. Amen. <laughs> number two, not only the priority, but number two, we see the people. Listen, we're urging and sharing the gospel not only because of priority, but because of the people. Notice what Jesus says here in verse 35. He says, do not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for the harvest. In this verse here, we have what we understand are imperatives in the Greek text. An imperative is simply a command, not an option. The two imperatives that we have here by way of command are lift. Everybody say lift. And look. Everybody say look. Jesus gave the disciples two commands. He just had a conversation with Samaria the woman. The disciples are confused out of their ever-loving mind. They're even more confused because they put food before him. Now they've got the response. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And now Jesus is going to interrogate them. Amen? Good job, right? Here's, here's the interrogation. Do you not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest? Hey, boys, listen. Are you making excuses? He says, do you not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, that is attention. I say to you, lift up your eyes. Let me, let me break it down in any character translation. This is, you know, country boy translation. Get your head out of the gutter. Y'all with me? Everybody with me? Get your head out of the gutter. Lift up your eyes, and I want you to look at the fields. If anybody would understand this, this passage of Scripture, it ought to be West Kentucky. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is agrarian, like Jesus does in most cases, agrarian language. <laughs> Lift up your eyes. That is to say, get them out of the gutter, boys. Lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for the harvest. Jesus is using this language, obviously, as an illustration, an application, all in one, to indicate not the grain fields, but to teach a, more, a greater truth. The greater truth is there are people all around you. And these people that are all around you are ready for the harvest, but somebody's got to go get them. Y'all with me, Chief Cornerstone? Somebody's got to take a step forward. Somebody's got to get in the field. They got to roll up their sleeves. They're going to have to get in the field. They're going to have to sweat. They can't be looking over what that person's doing and what that person's doing. They can't be complaining about where we ought to be versus where we should be. But they're in the field. Jesus says, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they already wide for the harvest. That is to say, there are people in the harvest, and these people should cause us to be urgent. Amen. Listen to me, Chief Cornerstone. Something's true about every place that I've been in Kentucky, in my role at the Kentucky Baptist Convention, I lived two and a half years in Richmond. I served the eastern half of the state. Of course, now God's opened a door back, uh, or opened a door to come back to West Kentucky to serve in this row, to serve the western region of our state. Every church I go to, whether there's 350, 400 people, 1,000 people, or 10 people, here's what I constantly know when I go there. I pass by homes in every one of those churches I go to. Yeah, you, do. Amen. you know what's in those homes? People. Lost people. Yeah. Statistics tell us that 80% of Kentucky is unchurched on any given Sunday. Lostness is so large around this chief cornerstone 
You could fill up every Bible-believing church in Graves County four times over, and we still wouldn't have enough space for them. People are lost, and people are perishing. Here's a question I've got for you. Who's going to go get them? It's what Jesus would say, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. Chief Cornerstone, I understand I'm preaching to the choir this morning. You're all knocking it out of the park. You've got, again, one of the best pastors, best staff. And I'm not just saying that in all the state that I know and all, I mean, all the world as far as I'm concerned. God has assembled a great group here, and I'm looking at a great church. Y'all looking good this morning. God's used you. This in itself, we're about to get to this last point, and I'm going to pray, and we're going to have that time of invitation. This is, this is listen, this, this is a witness to what God has done. Church, don't ever grow old. Don't, don't let any of this get numb. If this has gotten numb to you, get on the altar and just ask God to give you a fresh heart. Don't, don't you get numb to this. Don't you, listen, don't you for a minute take for granted what God has done here. Because the best I can tell, and since I, well, I'm very careful. I will get kicked out of here and get kicked out of my role and everything else. But I'm just going to say it at this point because I don't get to get anything loose. Best I can tell, boy, they ain't been this way ever. God's done a good work here. God's done a good work here. God has taken what was something that was dead. Amen? And brought it back to life. Honest to goodness. Let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not take for granted what God's doing. What this is about is about people. This is about people. And this is the truth of the matter. You're just getting started, church. You didn't, I mean, you may not come to hear that this morning, but you're just getting started. I'm an outsider looking in. I don't know a lot of the past. I don't know a lot of the history. I don't know a lot of the, the, what the vision going forward. But I can at least say this because I know your pastor. I know your staff. I know many of you in this place. Listen, this is just getting started. Buckle up. Get busy. Listen, many of you are in the fields. Keep living in the fields. Keep working in the fields. Keep sharing the gospel. Why? Because lost people are really lost. Some of you got family members, they're lost. Listen, keep praying for them. Some of you have stopped praying because you hadn't seen nothing. It's not because you intentionally stopped praying. You just become bored with it, just to be honest. And you need to pick it back up this morning. You need to regain and recapture that heart for lost people. Some of you at one time, you were bearing down praying in, in regard to this church. You had a burden for this church. God was using you in this church, and now you've taken a back seat, and you're just on coast mode. Listen, there are people all around this church and in this county that needs somebody to tell them about Jesus. Listen, we're going to be urgent about the gospel, not because it's about TVs or, or buildings or budgets or anything else. We're going to be urgent about the gospel because this is flesh and blood going on here. This is about eternity at stake. This is about heaven and this is about hell. And this is about telling lost people in your family and in your friends that they can know a Savior. His name is Jesus. So church, let's get busy. Let's keep busy. Let's stay focused on God. And by His Spirit and His work, He'll help us. And this will be a work if He tarries without last all of us when we're dead and gone. Leads us to the last point before we have this time of invitation. I'll be very quick. We see the priority about the Father's will. We see it's people. He said, lift and look. And then lastly, we see the partnership. I love this. There's this great partnership going on. Notice what he says in verse 36. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows, everybody say sows, and he who reaps, everybody say reaps, may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored, Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Jesus is talking to the disciples in regard to this Samaritan town. What is Jesus telling them? He is telling the disciples that others before them have preached the gospel. Others before them have labored in the fields of Samaria. And Jesus, because the Father's will was directing him, amen, to Samaria... I must needs go through Samaria. He had an encounter with a Samaritan woman, this conversation about eternal life. 
This Samaritan woman, she goes back to the town. She starts telling everybody about the Christ. And now Jesus is using this wonderful scenario, this wonderful uh, placement of eternal truth to teach that this is about a partnership. And the disciples in this moment, Jesus is telling them, listen, there have been many people before you that have labored. They have labored in the fields and now you're entering into the fields and you are experiencing a harvest this is about a partnership that is bigger than ourself other people have labored and now we are entering in to their labors that begs another question or maybe comment or maybe exhortation are we being faithful today with what God has given us so that those coming behind us will have a field to step into so that they'll experience a harvest. When I study the history of this church, this church goes way, 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 way back. The work that God started here goes way back. Best I can tell, I guess, before any of us were around. You know what happened? Some time ago, I don't know, but some time ago there was a group of people that got together and prayed. God formed a church. They were a gospel preaching church. Lost people got saved. The gospel was sold in this community. Those people have died. Now they're with Jesus. Now it's you and me. Here we are. We don't do anything in isolation, church. Teamwork makes a dream work. Amen? Others have labored. Now we're entering into their labors. God's given us a task. The task before us is to be faithful in the fields. For you and I to share the gospel. For you and I to keep this gospel work going strong. For you and I to keep on keeping on. So that if the Lord tarries and he calls all of us home, there's going to be a faithful generation coming behind us that will be able to step into the work and they'll carry on this work and they'll share the gospel and they'll see people get saved that maybe we shared with that we didn't see get saved. But here's the ultimate reality. This is teamwork to the degree that we rejoice together. One sows and another reaps. There's not more emphasis on the one sowing and the one reaping. It's about being faithful where you are right now. It's about lifting up your eyes and looking at the fields. It's about living surrendered, having a deep priority, a main priority on the Father so that when you and I are focused and surrendered to what the Father wants out of our life, we're doing what He wants. And when we're doing what we want, we're going to have our eyes lifted up and looking at people all around us as we go Sunday to Sunday. And then the truth of the matter is, as you and I share the gospel, as you and I communicate the gospel, you and I will rejoice. We're going to rejoice with those who have sold the a good seed and if we're dead and gone we're going to rejoice with those who come behind us to reap what we sowed this is a kingdom work and chief cornerstone I believe with all of my heart the best days are ahead for this church as you continue to reach people of the gospel but it must include a priority it must include us being about people and it must be about us understanding this is a partnership together because we can always do it better together for his glory Amen. as we close today I'd love for you to bow your head and close your eyes this morning as our worship team comes and assembles I don't know where you're at in your walk with God maybe you're here this morning you're lost without the Lord Jesus Christ Maybe you're here this morning and somewhere in this sermon, eternity weighed so hard on you that you surrendered in that moment. You couldn't take it anymore. Praise God for it. This invitation time, everybody's going to be standing here in just a moment. We're going to be singing. It's the time for you to respond. Come forward and declare you got saved. Some of you this morning, many others are Christians. 
and you just need to be obedient. Maybe some of you have been saved and you've never been baptized. And you need to come, grab Brother Keith by the hand and say, I, I want to be obedient to the Father's priority in my life. And I can't be completely obedient if I don't follow him in baptism. You've been saved, but you've never been baptized afterwards. Complete obedience. Complete surrender. Unashamed. Focused. Some of you, God's Spirit's dealing with your hearts. Some of you men in here are being called to preach. God's been tugging at your heart for some time, and you've been given every excuse under the sun to why you can't. You need to be obedient. Some haven't been reading your Bibles, haven't been praying, haven't been nearly engaged. And this morning you say, yeah, I need it. I, I'm missing the fire. The fire doesn't start in the work. The fire starts before the Father. Being surrendered. Saying yes. That's it. Some of you just need to put your yes on the altar this morning. That's what you need to do. You don't know the end result, just put your yes on the altar. Some of you need to come pray for that lost person in your family, your friends, neighbors, co-workers. You need to come lift them up. Don't, don't you discredit that on the altar. Lift them up before the Lord. Pray for Bobby or John or Sue or Jill. Pray for them. Beg God to save them. And then release yourself to be used to share the gospel with them. That means you're going to have to pray for boldness. Some of you have become numb to what God's doing here. You once were excited, but you've lost it. I beg you, from a personal standpoint, don't get numb to what God's doing here. God's doing a great work. Others of you are just still struggling with what it means to be a Christian. In just a moment, when we all stand, I'm going to ask you on the very first verse, if you need to be saved, to come. Grab somebody beside you, some, bring somebody with you, but come and get saved. Repent of your sins. And place your faith in the one who died shedding his blood and rose for you. He's inviting you to come. He's not hiding. He's not making this hard. The Father's here. He wants you to step in his will. Let's pray. Father God.